finalizar esta, esta sesión. Eh, como nos acompaña Don, don Gloria, eh, vamos a hacer la sesión, como sabéis, en, en inglés. Es que me voy, a, voy a cambiar de idioma, pero quería antes eh, agradeceros eh, que estéis aquí, a pesar de, de las altas temperaturas de Madrid y, en particular, las altas temperaturas que, que tiene Matadero. So, uh, I was uh, thanking people for coming uh, in so hot afternoon to, uh, to yeah. Matadero and to be with us. Uh, I am sure that you are not going to regret to be here because we are going to have a very, a very interesting uh, conversation with, uh, with Tom. Um, as you know, we are going to use the uh, unlikely dialogues methodology. <laughs> that uh, it, it, it means if you have never, haven't, uh, have not been uh, with us in other kind of these sessions, uh, it means that uh, our speaker, Tom, he will have uh, around 25, 30 minutes uh, uh, conference, and then we are going to open the floor to have a, a real uh, interactive session. Uh, I, I will moderate the, the session and um, mm, at the end, um, Maria Angeles she will make like a summary of the main uh, contributions that we have had and it will be the base for publishing a uh, post with what has happened here today. Uh, around, we, we will have uh, some minutes uh, to move our legs and at six, those who want who want, uh, we are going to have um, a guided uh, visiting to uh, commissionarios, the exhibition that we have in the next uh, room. So uh, it will we will have the opportunity to understand what uh, is happening there, which is the uh, uh, approach that this important exhibition that comes from uh, Lisbon and was before in, uh, in London and in other countries uh, is, the, is uh, the, the message that in this uh, conference the, uh, the authors, uh, the artists want to share with, uh, with us. So we have a very exciting afternoon and uh, I think there is nothing, there is no other Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, Maria Angeles. No, um, I, I have to introduce uh, Tom and myself, sorry. <laughs> uh, Tom will introduce him um, uh, later, but I want to say he, he, he comes from uh, the University of Harvard. Uh, he is in charge of one of the main uh, sustainability programs in that university, and we are very lucky because he's uh, spending uh, this week in, in Madrid. We are uh, uh, involved in some courses and activities in the university and in the city. And we also have the, the opportunity to talk and to, to think uh, in the possibilities of collaboration and being conscious of the urgency of the transformation that we need. So for us it is uh, a privilege to, to have you come here in, in Madrid these, these days. They have, we have had uh, another colleagues from Harvard last week. In fact, we shared with them a session here at, at Matadero. Why Matadero? Because uh, my university, the Technical University of Madrid, through the center ITD, Technology and Innovation for Human Development Center, have a partnership with other uh, actors to uh, demonstrate that we can deliver innovation through new ways, to a much more collaborative ecosystem where we as university, Matadero as a cultural center, where more than two million visitors each year come, come here, citizens that, that are interested in what is happening here, and the City Hall of Madrid, and the industry, and grassroots uh, uh, organizations. We are working together to accelerate the kind of, of transformations that, that we need in a, in a city that is many cities in the world have to face the challenge of the uh, climate crisis that we, we have now, it's happening now. 
And um, at the same time, we are convinced, we are a, techn a technical university, the Technical University of Madrid, that technology innovation is crucial, but alone cannot be the answer to the kind of challenges that, that we have. So we have to combine uh, technical innovation with institutional innovation, above all in terms of public policies, and we also have to involve people through social innovation processes. What uh, we don't know how to do, and we are learning, mm -hmm. is how to uh, make the adequate mixture, the, the adequate mix of these different sources of new, new ideas, new answers, and, and innovation. But we are convinced that the acceleration that we need to provoke another trajectories of development and of uh, uh, of uh, relationship uh, among, uh, among uh, actors uh, deserve to uh, test new ways of radical collaboration between between actors. That's what we are uh, doing. Now we have good news from the European Union and from uh, other uh, uh, actors, important actors in, the, in our scene, that uh, also think that the classical channels and tools to provoke changes and innovation are not adequate for the complexity and the speed of the change that we need. So with Tom, I'm sure that we are, we are going to have the opportunity to talk about these, these things. Um, well, Tom, the floor is yours. Okay, Sorry thank you, Carlos. Sorry for not being very... Uh, um, uh, uh, concise? Concise, sorry. And again, it's a pleasure having you here. All right. Well, thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you, all the folks here, ITD, UPM. The pleasure is mine. The inspiration is wonderful. And uh, it truly is a pleasure uh, to be here, be here in Madrid, such a wonderful city. Um, but also, um, you know, this is about this unlikely dialogue is so important. And so I'm really looking forward to engagement in our conversation this afternoon, this dialogue that we're going to have. So on this radical innovation, I'd like to pick up on this theme and tell you a little bit about who I am and what I represent as part of this uh, nearly 400-year-old institution at, uh, in the United States, the oldest uh, college. Well, I'm part of, as it's seen down below, the Harvard Extension School. All right. And in and of itself, it's been 110 years ago when the Harvard Extension School was started. But the point was to extend, unlock the gates, the ivory tower gates of Harvard University to the world. And technology is really helping us in doing that. And part of an innovative program in sustainability that's part of an innovative effort at Harvard University to extend us globally uh, through distance learning education, that's what I do. So with faculty of nearly 150, both part of Harvard University from our medical school, our school of public health, our divinity school, our law school, um, our graduate school of uh, design, and elsewhere. Uh, universities that we have expertise that we bring in, as well as practitioners. And I'm a practitioner. I've been a practitioner in sustainability for nearly 20 years and became the first director of the sustainability program four years ago. We are now 350 matriculated master students studying sustainability. We are one of the largest sustainability programs in the world, and my students are predominantly outside of Harvard Yard. More than 80% of them are outside my fair state of Massachusetts. About 25% are, are international. And so with technology, with partnerships such as ITT U UPM, we are doing everything we can to accelerate, accelerate the practitioning of sustainability, the knowledge of sustainability, the skill sets required associated with sustainability. And it's hard work. There are a lot of headwinds right now. And I'm going to talk about the headwinds today because we really do need to engage in them. And uh, we need to think about the things that we know, the things that we can share, but also the things that we don't know and how we can collaborate and uncover those blind spots. So that's my 
challenge for you is to challenge me. And we challenge, we challenge all of us uh, today. So, a little bit of background on this topic. And set it up, and then also set up what I want for this unlikely, but hopefully maybe more likely dialogue that will happen. Benefits and impacts of the Green New Deal. How many have heard of the Green New Deal? How many would know? We got one, we got a couple people, probably since it's quite hot out, you made a trip here and you've, you're ready to talk about uh, the Green New Deal. All right, so let me give you a little bit of background, then we'll go into a lot of detail, but not too much. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. How many know this young woman? Very brave young woman, the youngest congresswoman, youngest person in the US Congress right now, 29 years old. Recently elected in our midterm elections. She's from the 14th Congressional District of the state of New York. Along with, in my fair state, Senator Edward Markey, who's our junior senator, um, have launched this Green New Deal resolution. And what's so unique about the Green New Deal is that not only are we looking to tackle the challenges associated with climate change, that being the grand goals of reducing by nearly 50% by the year 2030, which if I do my math right, it's somewhere around 3,835 days away. It's not that far away, and that's kind of a theme for today. As Carlos said, is urgency. There's an enormous amount of urgency in this area. So as we look at 2.5, uh, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, degrees centigrade, which is really what has been recognized by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report this fall, driven by island nations that said, you know what, this discussion around the Paris Agreement at two degrees Celsius is not good enough. It's not good enough because we are going to have island nations and the people there being um, refugees. We are going to see large planetary actions such as our, our coral reefs disappear nearly by 99% we are going to see other major actions. But now combine that with an opportunity. Because we have, a, we have a couple of choices here. We can either sit back on our heels, stay the same, or look at this as an enormous opportunity. And an enormous opportunity to make the world a better place. Because we choose to do that. We choose to do this. It is in our ability to make choices. And that's what this is about. So what's really unique, the Green New Deal merges social justice. How many people are from the United States here today? Several people, all right. I'm gonna read through the Green New Deal resolution. I'm going to go into some details, some very frank details of what's going on in the United States. And um, one of the themes one of the themes that I'm going to talk about today is the intersection between this area of sustainability and political action, which is very challenging as an academician, particularly one that's involved in technology and science. I am discouraged. I am discouraged from being politically active. But as a systems thinker, as someone in the sustainability field, it goes against my general philosophy of connecting different systems together. And that is the provocative, unlikely dialogue we're gonna talk about today, all right? So let me get into it. This is language straight out of the resolution. It's not a bill, it's a communication by our Congresswoman and our Senator to say what is the issue. The report from IPCC, as I mentioned, it's clear. Whether you deny it or don't, human activity is, is causing observed climate change, and there are those that are challenging that statement. As I mentioned, the two degrees C will cause massive of regions of effect. 
a number of five billion in lost in economic output by the US, wildfires that will continue to burn more than twice what we currently have, losing 99% of our coral reefs globally, 350 million more people displaced, exposed to deadly heat. If Syria is any indication to us, the last decade of a 1.5 million people being displaced and the rippling effects of the change in politics throughout Western Europe. Imagine 350 million people and what may happen over the course of the next couple of decades. One trillion dollars of public infrastructure, coastal real estate, try to put the numbers there, but this 1.5 degrees Celsius, you know, this is where changing planetary effects, planetary boundaries are gonna be put to the limit and that really requires this goal of 40 to 60%, more or less, let's say 50% reductions by 2030, a mere 3,000 plus days, and then we gotta get to carbon neutrality by 2050, all right? Well within the reach of many of you in this room. You know, it's gone from being future generations to no, it is all of us. More, the more majority of us here today will be alive or nearly close to that by 2050. We're, it is within our scope, certainly by 2030. So, so where the resolution, all right? U.S. in, a, in an economic crisis now. And we talked about Madrid rolling back its air quality. The United States, for the first time in history, declining life expectancy. That's, a, that's just, not only is it amazing, it's, it's just unacceptable. It's unacceptable. We've had nearly four decades of hourly wages stagnating, socioeconomic mobility really not happening, bargaining power of workers as we went from an industrial to post-industrial to a service-oriented economy, so erosion of economic power, our public sector workers are really challenged by climate change, particularly in, in, in times where neoliberalism in the United States from the Reagan administration has challenged government control, government intervention, rolling back control, looking at capitalism, capitalism unbarred, to then not only our Republican Party, but also our Democratic parties, looking at capitalism and deregulation from a variety of things, Clinton administration and financial deregulation. It's a general trend where from the local, state, and federal levels, support has diminished. We have the greatest inequality since the 1920s. The Great Recession has occurred where the top 1% since 2008, the recovery, wonderful recovery, 91% went to that 1%. It was reported actually this past week, the recent tax rollback, 17% of the tax benefits went to the 1% as well. So we're looking at continued reinforcement of wealth concentration. The next bullet. The conversation that continues, or lack thereof, around the racial divide. The color of your skin determines your financial success in our country. 20 times the wealth. 20 times the wealth. I'm going to get into that a little bit in the Boston area as, a, as an example. A gender gap that continues where women make 80%. 80%, this is unheard of, right? Unheard of, and why, why, why does this continue? And so here's our challenge. Combine that with climate change, looking at the injustices, so that's what's different about Green New Deal, because it's connected. Climate change is so connected to these injustices, the social environmental injustices, considered a direct threat, 
Now, this is the new resolution trying to speak to a, a broad base to understand what we're talking about. Looking at what World War II created as a, a middle class, a strong, much stronger middle class. However, there were issues in vulnerable communities of the Green New Deal of World War II and getting out of the recession or, excuse me, the depression of uh, the Great Depression of the United States. We're looking to be much, much more inclusive here. And so we're looking at national scales of social, industrial, and economic mobilization. That's what this is about. This is an economic empowerment act that's part of solving many of the intractable problems and making sure it's incredibly inclusive and counteractive to the injustices. So, the language associated with the resolution begins to get detailed. And I'm not going to go into those details line by line here. But what's important is that we invest in actions that are looking at receiving um, results that are low emissions, billions of jobs, create resiliency. The injustice of those that would be exposed for the benefits of others economically. We need to correct these injustices and create them in a very equitable manner. Now the type then gets even tinier because the resolution wanted to basically create a menu list of what we're trying to do. But within this great big menu list, these are the subparagraphs that are the goals of the Green New Deal that then look at the mobilization of those, right? One of the things that's left out, the emissions reductions targets. We want to be neutral. We want to be zero emissions. But there's nothing about the 50% by 2030, right? So there's, I point that out as a, we, you know, this is progressive, but still it had to hold back. The language had to be a, much more careful than that. And then here are the, the goals. Again, tiny type, but important that they're being laid out, that this is a first step. This is presenting to the Congress, both houses. This is what we're going to be doing, all right? So climate change solving, social justice, political movement. That's what this is about. All right, so this is a very, uh, I should say, um, personal and, and uh, uh, situation in terms of really spent the last couple of days as I was asked to do this unlikely dialogue to really rethink the research I was working on. Actually, so I really thank my ITT, ITD UPM colleagues here. Because I started looking at a tool to assess Carbon-free Boston by 2050, same as the Green New Deal. Something called a multi-regional input-output methodology. To work with colleagues at Boston University in their, if you will, ad hoc method of looking and understanding, well, what are the issues for Boston and what is that trajectory? So I had a hammer, it was a phrase. Yeah, you have a hammer, you're looking for a nail, right? And I said, I think I see a nail. I looked at it, I see a nail and I got a hammer. There's this multi-regional input-output economic methodology which basically does a comprehensive assessment of all of the economic activities in a regional district. I can pair that with carbon emissions and I can start finding out stuff and tell the world how wonderful this is going to be. I can see where the jobs are going to be. I can do all this wonderful stuff. Right? So my colleagues at uh, uh, Boston University started to lay out the urgency, one of them being Boston's a coastal city. We're looking at eight inches or so in the next, over the next decade. By 2050, we're looking at one and a half feet, so half a meter, which will inundate my colleagues at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who are just down the street from us. We'll be a little bit on the high ground, but it's, that, it's in our backyard. Foot and a half is in the backyard, in the back Harvard Yard area. It's close. 
If we get to 2070 and by 2100, nearly, nearly more than two meters, it's an unfortunate situation for Boston. So this is front and center. This is front and center for the Boston area. We also have, as we've experienced in Madrid, some record heats. We're looking at nearly 25 to 90 days temperatures, five days above 100 degrees. So we're going to really shift in Boston in terms of what the weather and what we will tolerate uh, for weather. And the last item, we're looking at larger rain events. So whether it be rain or snow, these are large events that will be happening in the Boston area as well. All right, so let's get to some more of the pretty pictures and what we know. So this is where we are now. And we use a lot of natural gas. Because we're in the Northeast, Northeast United States. We use a lot of oil. We use it to heat our buildings. Commercial buildings, residential buildings. Oil, we use transportation. A lot of fossil fuels. We do have electricity. It's got a sliver of renewables. It's got some hydro and nuclear. As some know from New England, we're taking our nuclear power offline. It's coming off in pieces. So that piece will need to be replaced. So projections by Boston University. Hey, this is where we want to be in 2050. We can do it. We can do it by clean energy, so electricity. So we need to electrify as much as we can our commercial buildings as well as our residential buildings. And we need to shift dramatically away from our fuels, our liquid fuels. All right, nice picture. Pretty. This is called a Sankey diagram, by the way. Bars the width of the quantities. All looks nice. Here's the nice transition. Here we go. Here we go, because the wonderful curves that tell us without um, any change in our political environment, we can't get as far as we can. What we need to do is this new initiative, this new carbon-free Boston initiative to bring everyone together so we can get to the targets. And what natural gas that we have left over, we'll do some sort of mitigation through sequestration. So plant some trees, do other areas of helping others to do some carbon trading, so to speak. So it's still there, but at least we'll try to do some mitigation that way. All right. Still all great. You know, the wonderful work by Boston University. So the boundary of analysis. We're going to look at buildings, transportation, and waste. All right. And as we look at those activity sectors, all right, the, what they supply, the grid forecast, fuels, and offsets, to get our results and our emissions reductions. All right. It's all good. We're going to get there. Well. Needed to leave out a few things. Logan Airport, major airport. It's in Boston. Let's not deal with that problem right now. Okay. Recall, I, I, there's a little urgency on this. Maybe, are we going to keep this in? Are we going to not keep it in? What's the benefit of it? Here's the other one. Actually, can, can anyone guess what? There's another. There's another piece that's missing. Anyone know what the other piece is missing in this in this model? A little bit of shopping. Everything we buy, whether it be stuff or ex services, that's also left out. Okay, that's usually forty percent of the picture. By the way. Not quite sure exactly how much the Logan Airport is, but it's pretty substantial. So there's ways that we can do our ladder diagram, bring this down, zero waste. Waste is actually a small sliver, but we're looking at buildings, strong performance standards that are in place, deep energy retrofits, uh, and low carbon intensity electricity grid. So that's a big part of how we can bring this down. So you can see that the building fuels, the building's electricity, this is the pieces, and then with the electricity supply itself. So cleaning the electricity supply. So these, you know, these three factors that we can get, basically making our buildings more efficient, doing re retrofits. Essentially, we have gas stoves, we have gas boilers, basically unplugging the natural gas pipes out of our buildings is what we need to transition. All right? And this grid itself, transitioning the grid itself and cleaning that up. You know, this is our, our boundary. 
All right. But consistent with the Green New Deal, consistent with the Green New Deal, the Boston University researchers also are looking at equity issues. And this is a, a, a map overlay of both children, people with limited English proficiency, low to no income, adults who are older, people of color, people with disabilities. You know, will they be able to be brought along with the, this wonderful carbon-free movement that in many cases may be a little expensive, retrofits to your home, paying more for electricity versus natural gas. And so when we do the vulnerability assessment, our social vulnerability analysis, we have some key communities, key communities that are going to be, it's going to be very challenging for them to transition. And it goes back to the Green New Deal and to make sure that they're not left out, all right? So when I was asked to do this unlikely dialogue, this is what got me thinking. It was this, it was this map that's really started me thinking about, isn't it wonderful, all these technologies, possibilities of jobs. So I started looking at uh, uh, sources that I'm aware of in terms of um, accessible analysis of carbon footprints by the zip code level. That's our postal level in the United States. Right? So this is New England. And the red to the green is intensity. So the red color means you're more intense carbon-wise, less intense green, right? Those in rural areas, right? This is, this is by per capita, right? In many cases, the homes are wood-fired. Um, they're not connected to natural gas pipes. They might have a, a, a propane tanks, but by and large, they use less fossil energy. They do maybe a bit of transportation. It's probably one of their largest impacts. So of course, right, Boston, it's all red, right? It's red. Let's, uh, so let's uh, look at that, because that means that those in this more populous area, it's red, right? But when you drill down, when you drill down to Boston, it's green. It's green. You look at the quantities associated to the poorest, the poorest zip code, poorest zip code in Boston. You need to transition. 25.5, let me put it that in context. This is one of the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest towns in Boston out in the suburbs, three times, three times greater. What are they spending on? Transportation, housing, food, services, goods, all the bars. All the bars are higher, okay? So I could do my fancy input-output analysis, on transition, that we need to electrify Boston, but we have some issues here. We have some serious equity issues of who we are asking and what we're asking they are, what they're going to do. Right. So in this unlikely dialogue, in this unlikely dialogue, I raise the question, as an analyst, as someone measuring the dollars, as someone measuring the CO2 molecules, using this broad-based regional economic I.O. tool. Is that what I should be focused on? All right, so let me give you one, one more, or two more pieces here. We mentioned, Carlos mentioned the sustainable development goals. All right, so here they are. This is the United Nations. Sustainable development goals as it relates to the areas that we should be focused. Now, there are 169 different uh, sub-goals associated with this, targets with each one of these in total. But here you are. Here's, here's the map. Internationally agreed upon. May not be exactly perfect, but one, one that helps us to further discuss and understand and connect to the things that we should be concentrated on. Certainly number 13, 
is it all the way at the end? Climate change, that's the one we're thinking about. That's the one we really are urgent about. But the sustainable development goals, as we in a, amongst us in our group think about the interconnectivity of each one of them and how powerful the interconnectivity is and how important to think about when you're doing climate change, but yet you need to look at issues of development, good health and well-being that might actually use more resources and the counterbalance of those. So we're in a world of incredibly challenging decision making ahead of us. Right? So, last slide. I presented this slide to the Journey students this morning at uh, uh, ITD UPM who are going through a four week intensive experience of collaboration and looking at climate and solutions, finding solutions to climate, right? Which is wonderful news, right? Building ITD UPM, working very hard to radically change and accelerate and connect with this issue. So when we talk in the sustainability language, you think about systems thinking and system thinking and what it means and how we need to look at structures and how things are connected and different points in how things feedback, reinforce both to solve problems, to accelerate them, but also to mitigate, to dampen them using negative feedback loops, in other words, stop emissions from happening. Multiple scales, global to regional, all the way down to the local. Domains, there's only three listed here, but took, you know, look at the 17 sustainable development goals, that's the, the domains we talk about, but it's this last bullet. Right. This is the one after ITD UPM asked me to come here, I had to really start thinking about that last bullet a lot more. And, and then there's, yes, it's the people, the social systems. That one, the politics and where we are in politics. So I have some thoughts. I'm, re I'm ready for some questions. I'm not going to lead any of you witnesses. What are you thinking? Let's discuss. Let's dialogue. Many thanks, Tom. Well, thank you. So, Tom, I forgot to say that we are in the Mutant Institute of Environmental Narratives. It is, I mean, okay. Um, it's like uh, the fruitful of the collaboration, uh, Matadero, City Hall of Madrid, and the university. And the, the dream of this uh, institute was precisely to, to provoke um, and, to, and to, to think in a bolder, more systemic manner. So your, your speech has been really, really uh, what we were expecting uh, to, to, to lead us to, to realize that we are not alone here in Madrid, that you in Boston are dealing with similar problems and what we all are called to be able to understand the complexity and in spite of the complexity to act and to act rapidly because there, there is an urgency. Then the, the idea is the first time that we um, uh, organize an unlikely dialogue here in this house um, but well I think it's going to, to work uh, as, as it works in, in our university. Uh, uh, we are going to ask for your thoughts, your asks, uh, your, your questions, or your, your, your contributions. Your, and and um, the first rule is that you have not to compete with Tom. Huh? He comes <laughs> from Harvard, <laughs> so <laughs> be careful. And the, the thing is the, to, 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 to try to, to, uh, to, to to make a, a real and deep uh, and deep conversation. So I, I I want to know if someone's someone wants to open 
the, the dialogue, the, the conversation. I think there are many, 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 many questions and issues that you left in your presentation that are really inspirational and resonates uh, a lot with what we are working here in Madrid. So, please, please. okay. And, uh, another, another thing, sorry. Uh, first of all, a brief introduction of yourself. I'm Francisca Garrigues. I'm working for a project that some of you know, which is called Oceania, Expedición Mar Azul, a journey around the planet to turn the world around. Um, we're looking for outsiders, 20 to 30, to turn around the world. So um, I make my pitch of publicity here. But one of the things that in learning about sustainability, I, I have a difficulty understanding is is it our grandparents that didn't do anything, or great-grandparents that didn't do anything? Is it because now we have knowledge that it's become such a matter? And why is the part of the population that is richer and more knowledgeable, in a certain sense, that they have more access, um, the ones that are not doing anything, when I know for a fact that I have uh, information that multimillionaires and companies are no, asking scientists where to build their places in order not to have. Where is the black hand around everything? And, and that okay. boggles me. Right. <laughs> Philosophical. First part, first part of your question. Half of the greenhouse gas emissions Half of them occurred in the last 30 years, all right? So pretty much, uh, some of you younger folks here, but pretty much it's us. So not the start of the Industrial Revolution. What's that, 30 years ago? Only since 1990? It's our problem. That's why I look at it. I own it. 1990, what was I doing? I was setting up the greenhouse gas emissions protocol for the state of California and working on that. That's what I was working on, working, doing, you know, trying to, trying the best we could to, to move that forward. So we own it. I'll just categorize your question as those with means and those who don't have the ability to get out of harm's way. I'll just put it in those two big buckets of groups of people. And lack of a better, and, I, and this is where the dialogue's going to start. So this is my opinion, right? I think it's human nature to not change unless we have to. Stay the course, because it's easier. It takes less energy. It's being efficient. Yeah? All right? Yeah, there's been some studies on, like, when the, when the, transportation tube went down in London for the first time in many, 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 many years. And people had to figure out how to drive, how to get to work in a different way, right? People had been working the same place for 20 years. All of a sudden, this one, one time it goes down for two days, their, their commute's completely disrupted, and somewhere around 14 to 15 percent of them started going the new way that they found. It wasn't until chaos occurred, it wasn't until something tipped them and pushed them that they finally, after 20 years, decided, oh, there's a better way to get to work today. And I know it sounds as simple as that, but I think we live in our cocoons, we live in our spaces of what we're familiar with. And by and large, those with means are not feeling it. They're not sacrificing. That's my short answer. I could go, I could go on longer, but that's, that's my short answer. And then there's, then there's the political, there's the political answers. And the political answers revolve around power. And I would say in the United States, we aren't in a democracy. We are far from a democracy, and that's what's, that's what's starting to really happen. And, and those who have uh, uh, vested assets in fossil fuels, control a lot of power, and that power is being used to continue to make sure their assets are valuable and their assets continue to create wealth 
is a big part of it. So. And if after this, we have a request. Yeah. Hi, thank you. My name's Terry Davis. I'm a uh, tourist from Florida, and uh, um, I'm doing nerd tourism. Thank you for being here, Terry. <laughs> but I'm also the, um, in my professional career, I'm the principal of Village Green Environmental Studies School in mm -hmm. South Florida, which is an environmental elementary school. We have a permaculture garden. We try to teach kids about sustainability, about solar electricity, those kinds of things, so that hopefully plant a seed that moving forward that they won't pray to the God of consumerism above all else, and that they won't think that when they go to the store, that's where the food just appears. So a couple of things. One is, I. One of my salient memories from middle school, when, which was about 1974 during the Arab oil embargo, we were in the throes of rationed gas, waiting, you know, if you're even if your license plate ended in an even number, you could get the gas on Tuesday. If not, you had to get gas on Thursday, all these kinds of things. And I remember sitting in a social studies class watching an old film from the 1950s, and uh, they talked about um, energy security and the, the, the risks of oil, and I thought, they knew about this and they didn't do anything? Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, that, that, that moment really resonates with me right now because I'm kind of seeing the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I do have a question. Oh, yeah. um, one just observation about the Green New Deal is that, like you said, vested interests will kill, literally, will kill to keep it from being implemented. Um, I like that you started out with the big picture and then you went to the small picture because then that implies that it's a much bigger picture, actually. And, what good is a LEED certified build in, in Boston if it's six feet underwater, right? So local, th you know, I used to subscribe to the ax axiom, think global, act local. That's not effective anymore, not in this crisis. So as an academician also, albeit not at Harvard yet, who knows, um, what you face academic constraints. Our, most re our governor that just became a senator um, forbade the um, Department of uh, Environmental Resources in Florida from mentioning climate change in any publications. Um, that's the kind of political climate in Florida. I even have a brother that's a climate change denier. Well, we don't talk anymore, but he's a climate change <laughs> denier. I mean, it's, it's really out there. It's driven by the media and propaganda, economic propaganda, and by the oligarchy that we live in that we call a democracy. My question is, you mentioned that you fight against academic constraints with respect to your message, I think. What tools do you use? I have to be really careful and talk mm -hmm. about anything other than the real reason that, that I'm doing these new things at my school. Um, but what tools do you use to kind of get around that um, and keep your job? <laughs> yeah, no. Very real, very yeah, real. No. As I have expressed to my colleagues here, Terry, a very excellent question, so let me just give you some of the guardrails, right? This picture, this picture. I cannot be seen or heard to, as an advocate of the Sustainable Development Goals, okay? And the reason, there's a good reason, is academic freedom, the ability to criticize as well as support, but not seen as solely an advocate and I have to say, let me use that a little bit. I think number 16, where you'll, you'll find the political activism to some sense set, set up, I'm starting to see, well, you know what? The Sustainable Development Goals is kind of weak on governance, very explicitly. It talks about effectiveness, but it doesn't talk about how truly some of the things that we should be thinking about in influencing our political institutions and making change happen. And there's, there's, there's some missing pieces of that. So that's one. But more to the point, next week when I'm presenting um, as part of, I'm in this uh, Society of Industrial Ecology. And industrial ecology is a field where we use natural systems as metaphors for industrial systems to make them better. Right? How can we make waste back into productive things? Right? The conversation that I'm having today, which I might have, I'm still trying to decide to some level, not appropriate, not appropriate in that domain. Even though I'm in this domain of systems thinking, I'm in the domain of life cycle sustainability assessment and the sustainability as a broad-based systemic view of the world, this conversation is provocative in that domain. 
and I'll take heat for it. I'm going out of the guardrails, right? And, uh, and, and that's, uh, as uh, scientists, when we become politically active, like Michael Mann at Penn State University, Michael Mann is famous for the hockey stick curve, the first one to really show the increased uh, CO2 concentrations and has been outspoken ever since and has taken a lot of heat, even death threats from, from his work. And so it is, it's this, I think your point, Terry, is very important. And that the, the shifting, shifting sands of the urgency and the risks associated with this, well, time for being courageous and time for being um, uh, antagonist in a civil society that's acting fairly uncivil at this point in time. Um, hello, uh, my name is Maria Moreno. I come from Colombia, um, visiting Madrid. I just finished my Erasmus program in the Netherlands. Um, mm -hmm. This is my last stop in Europe because flights are cheaper from here. Um, I've spent half of my short life studying the United Nations and how it works. And I've seen the sustainable development goals for a really long time, studied them thoroughly. Um, of course, I have still a long way to go, but um, in my studies, I've seen that the United Nations and this kind of institutions are a great scenario for negotiations and for designing frameworks. But I want to mention a concept and I want to hear your, your opinion about this, um, accountability. And the fact that we already have frameworks like, like the SDGs and we have a lot of plans. We have the Kyoto Protocol, the COP21, et cetera. But at the time of seeing how implementation works and how the governments actually act upon these measures, we see a lot of flaws, a lot of loopholes. And I say this coming from a country so rich in natural resources as Colombia that is right now going through a really deep crisis um, in every single way of the word, actually. Uh, how do you perceive the idea of accountability in scenarios such as the United Nations, specifically in the Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, congratulations on all the work that you do. and. Uh, wishing you courage to continue, and an excellent question, right? Your question, I think, begs or is indicative of where we are. The mere fact that we have to ask about accountability says how fragile it is that people are at the table. The United States has indicated it won't be at the table, and what that means. The dichotomy of Science is saying this, political posturing is saying something else. Without question, trust and accountability, equity at the global scale is going to be incredibly important, incredibly important. And it's unfortunate we're not even at that point of conversation yet, All right? That's maybe a bit of a non-answer, but I think that's, that's where we are, yeah. Oh, man. Hello, uh, thank you for the conference. I'm uh, an architecture student here in Madrid, and I, um, you, uh, you showed later um, before the, um, the charts about the, the, like the sources of energy from the city of uh, Boston, and, um, and you also mentioned that they are gonna turn down the nuclear power plant ne next to the city, I don't know. And they, of course, in the, um, in the case of Boston, it wouldn't be really a big deal. And, and now I'm asking kind of this question because there are some people that are, are arising of the idea of really, do we really need to refuse um, nuclear energy? And, and I know that around 20% of the electricity in the US is, comes from nuclear resources. And there's also been some other cases of implementation of renewable energies, for example, in Germany in the last decade, and they have turned down nuclear nuclear uh, power plants, and even though they have, uh, the implementation of renewable energies has increased, uh, the CO2 emissions have not really done, it's not, uh, not like that. So I really want to know your opinion about if we really need uh, nuclear energy in order to achieve this um, transition in the next, in the short uh, midterm. Okay, so uh, another easy question, right? 
Here's a very direct answer. If that nuclear power plant gets shut off and natural gas is used, that nuclear power plant should have been on. That's one of the, the what's happening in the United States, is natural gas is being used as a quote unquote bridging fuel to a reduction in carbon intensity. It's a fossil fuel. It has many, many other impacts associated with just not even just burning the methane and the leaks of the methane and so forth. So it really depends, and that's what the whole challenge on electricity grids is. It's a very dynamic system, incredibly dynamic system, and it, a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, the power that we need to satisfy the needs, uh, particularly if we're going to electrify the entire state. You know, just you know, what is that going to do? How is that going to happen? What it, you know, what loads, additional loads are we putting on? And how typically it's at each kilowatt hour that we need to add, it's always dirtier and a little bit more expensive. Because it's, it's like, as I, I like to say, it's like, a, it's like a carton of milk. It's got a shelf life. You generate electricity. That's it. So you've got to be able to be very predictive or reactive and so forth. But here's some words of positivity around this aspect of nuclear fission. All right, nuclear fission is a problem, but there are technologies to deal with the waste. Those technologies are being developed at MIT and other places. We just happen to use the technology of nuclear submarines in the US Navy as the primary method developed 70, 80 years ago now. Nuclear fission of a certain method. There's absolutely new technology there, as well as we have nuclear fusion. All right. And experimental and beyond bench scale is happening in France. And I can say I had a student this past semester, nuclear physicist from Tokyo University, and was looking at nuclear fusion in his lifetime as a viable energy source by the end of uh, the 2030 decade. And using that energy for then carbon sequestration. So there's incredibly innovative views on what nuclear power, but we need to educate ourselves on it and also be very frank on what the risks are. Now, Fukushima, most recently, right, showed risks associated with managing power systems that were supportive in events that were catastrophic. Could have been avoided. So we need to be very frank in what those risks are and very open as to how to mitigate those risks and identifying those risks. You know, technology is, of course, a tool for us, and it needs to be managed most appropriately. Now, going back, I think, to the real nugget of your question, which is climate change, potential exposure, nuclear materials to a population, to an area that cannot be used. Unfortunately, to me, that speaks to where we are in this urgency, which was earlier, Francesca, why haven't we done anything, right? So this is the price we pay. The price we pay is suboptimal solutions, solutions that we got to live with because we're waiting too long. And every day that ticks by is one less possibility of more favorable solutions as part of that. Yeah? Okay. Hi, um, sorry. I'm Raquel Nogueira. I'm a journalist uh, from Ethic uh, Magazine. So you can just check that out online, okay? Ethic.s. <laughs> and uh, I was trying just like to catch a bit of his question. And uh, uh, we've been seeing that uh, the U.S. is kind of moving towards renewable energies, mm -hmm. even though Trump's efforts of kind of like uh, undermine all the renewable energy uh, initiatives, saying like, yeah, wind turbines like, gets you cancer and things like that. And uh, I was wondering whether the US is really moving towards renewable energy, or is that just like a perception? Uh -huh. Yeah. So I can, spe I can speak to some detail on this. I have a yet another master's student who works for XL Energy out of Colorado. And he was telling me a story about uh, when they go for bids, they're, they're a distributor, a transmission distributor of electric uh, power in the, that part of the country. They are now seeing proposals from energy generators 
that include wind and solar with battery back that rivals the economic costs or economic model, so to speak, of natural gas and combined cycle generation? So the answer is absolutely yes. You know, despite uh, what we're hearing in terms of, if you will, uh, uh, if you will, rollbacks on regulations associated with air emissions and and uh, standards associated with coal fire plants, um, we're looking at still economics that it will will actually not make it, and it's still not fee uh, economically really uh, desirable for coal to continue. It won't. It's not economically the best choice. The real issue is natural gas. That's our Achilles heel. That is what we are gearing up for. That's where there's doubling down in that technology to deliver and not only supply for the United States, but actually be an exporter of natural gas in the next, within the next couple of years. Um, and so that is, a, is this rivaling of uh, renewable energy pricing. The story is going to be very tight. You know? And uh, also the realities are um, subsidies. Subsidies associated with the extractive industries of fossil fuels continue at very large scales, as well as one would consider the military interventions and the military presence the United States has around the world to protect its fossil fuel supplies. Right? So those are, additionally, one could look at them somewhat as subsidies, but they are, they are costs. Indirect costs that taxpayers generally pay for. I pay for anyone who's in the United States. We pay for our military power to the tune of $1 trillion a year to protect that type of, not exclusively of course, but that level of uh, energy security. Mm -hmm. So renewable energy is seen as a Green New Deal, is seen as a reduction of risk. It's a way to move forward for the United States. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, the um, powers that be within our, our political system uh, continue to protect the status quo. Uh, hello, my name is Uriel Fogué. I'm an architect, uh, principal of the LE Architecture Office, and by chance co-curator of this exhibition. Um, my question is related with, uh, thank you, with uh, uh, let's say the tension between uh, expert knowledge and, I could say, ordinary life. No? Mm. Because uh, usually uh, it looks like climate change is an expert matter. Uh, you know, we as experts talk and discuss about, but as you said before, there's going to be a very important um, challenge for certain communities that are going to find really challenging the ecological transition in their ordinary lives. No? It looks like the problem is very well mapped from an expertise point of view, but from the ordinary life, there is this, uh, uh, I can say, this connection. Mm -hmm. Even though the effects of ordinary life has have in the bill, in the carbon bill, a big um, uh, payment. No? So, how can we design, in your opinion, the connection between expert knowledge and ordinary life? And pushing a little bit forward, this idea, there's something that to us is very important and that we have discussed a lot in the uh, Institute of Environmental Narratives that has to do of, with uh, how to enroll people and this ordinary role in ecological programs, no? like in large planetary, big words, the, uh, technology concepts, etc., programs. And um, how important do you think desire uh, is an important fact for all this? I mean, uh, many mm -hmm. times these very big words um, mm -hmm. act for regular people as instructions, no? mm -hmm. recycle the paper. No? Mm -hmm. um, and if not, you get fined. No? There's this kind of, um, how can I say, uh, authority relationship. Mm -hmm. no? uh, but maybe a big challenge, and at least it's an open question here in the Institute, uh, would be how can we make these uh, sustainable development goals uh, become desirable for most of the people? How can mm -hmm. we enroll the people, not only through the following the instructions, but also involving desire, experience, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. 
unless we make them desirable, we're not going to succeed. Unless we make them success, uh, accessible, we won't succeed. Right? It's, it's very intrinsic into your question. The how, which is the more difficult part, right? It's like any, uh, any social movement, in my humble opinion. It's how we connect with each other. And it's going to be a variety of different ways. There's not going to be one single way. You know, generations, uh, a certain age, we find our own channels. Whether it be WhatsApp or Facebook no more, or that's for old folks. Some other social media that I haven't heard of yet that my kids use. Um, you know, it's all of these interconnections as well as the storytelling and making it truly personal. As an example, I, I gave this uh, example earlier this week around um, acceptance of uh, lesbian, gay, transgender, and bisexual acceptance in the United States that has been an, a, a very hopeful and positive essence of social change that can happen much shorter than a generation, right? And a lot of that had to do with someone knowing someone else personally, whether it be a son, a daughter, a father, a mother, a cousin, a friend, it became personal. And social change became very rapid. The unfortunate thing is, likely it will take stories. But for some reason, humans, we seem to forget very easily, like Hurricane Rachel that came through New York City that inundated this New York City subway station only a couple of years ago. It's like a forgotten past. The wildfires that happened in the state of California. I was just speaking for my own country. You know, yesterday's news. So I think it's important for us to remember, to not forget, to not forget. And, and also, I. I shared this story earlier with a couple of folks here at ITD UPM. I was at a UN um, uh, uh, activity. It was an event by this interfaith uh, group which brought together Muslims and uh, uh, Judaism and Catholicism uh, leaders from around the world. And there was one speaker, there was one speaker there, um, Rabbi Arthur Shire. And, um, Arthur Shire, Rabbi Arthur Shire, was born in 1930, March 20th of 1930, in Austria. Okay. He was on a train to Auschwitz when he was 14. It's 1944. He was old enough to know he was going to die. But somehow, luck of God, war ended. The war ended. And he was free. Went off to New York City, went to New York University, created one of the most prestigious temples he's now in charge of in Manhattan. And he told the story. He told this story that I will never forget. I will never forget the story. And the story was, as he was experiencing change in Vienna, where his friends were his friends, but he was Jewish, and they were still his friends, and they weren't. And as the war progressed, his friends no longer became his friends. And they were operating in civil society, and everyone was being civil, and everything was by the book. It was, everyone was friendly, but yet, slowly but surely, the Jews, his family, his other Jewish friends were removed from society very peacefully, very civilly put on trains. And his words were, do not tolerate. Do not tolerate in this world, in this civil world, when we see literally uncivil acti actions. And in the, in the vacuum of not talking about the things that are personal to us that we see, that's giving in. Like I said, I'll never forget that message. And we are getting to that point. 
we are getting to that point where civil society is making decisions for generations without really caring. They're being cruel, quite frankly. My name is Anna. I live here. Here I'm here in this in this in, in this neighborhood, and I'm a tutor student of architecture in the UPM. Mm -hmm. I'm very active in my community. Um, I'm very worried about the um, about what all these things you have been talking about um, related to the energy um, security. You said uh, about military. Um, points that the United States has around the world, mm -hmm. because at a certain point, um, this <sighs> you, it's, a, it's a cause and effect, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to keep these kind of energy sources, what is going to happen to the rest of the world, you know? And I'm talking about a lot of massive uh, refugees going from moving from Syria, Iraq, Ira Iran, to other countries, to Europe, all these crises about refugees you are, we are suffering around the world. Yeah. Uh, it's also, if you, we keep looking at United States as, a, as an example of energy security. What about the, no re the renewables energy sources we have in our own countries, like uh, solar panels, uh, wind turbines and everything like that, you know. And in local, I mean, they were talking about that the, we, are, we cannot keep going like uh, thinking globally and um, sorry, acting locally. Acting locally. Yeah. And for me it's important because in my neighborhood we have, um, we want to create communities, healthy communities. And because of the energy uh, we have to pay uh, light, uh, water, everything here. And um, sometimes the the grassroots movements we don't have the financial um, power, <laughs> financial uh, facilities to pay just things as simple as water bills or light bills and yeah. things like that. So no, you know what I mean. But yeah. I'm coming from the the bigger big pro, big picture. Yeah. Everything that is causing, and I'm talking about locally that we want to create a better communities, we want to keep, uh, to engage in dialogues with the uh, local government, um, uh, depending on the political view of the new party, for instance, in Madrid, yeah. we are having, uh, we have to think how we are going to deal with these issues, if we want to keep these uh, maybe uh, projects uh, citizenship projects we are we have in our neighborhoods to create better communities and healthy communities yeah. it's very very difficult you know what i mean and it's a pity because sometimes the um, university doesn't engage with a real ordinary life yeah. and this is something that we need to create a bridge to speak more from the university to um, protect and to support citizenship projects mm -hmm. and, see, and see how we think something simple as paying a water bill can contribute to the citizens to get more involved even in the sustainable development goals yeah. and believe in that. Thank you. I think I'm not, I'm not sure it worked out here, but it was a little mixture. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. It, it, it inspires a couple of thoughts for me to share. Um, there's a writer, Bill McKibben, yeah. also the organization 350.org, uh, wrote several books, one of them, The End of Nature. And I saw him speak uh, a couple of months ago. And his big message from Middlebury College, where he's a professor, was it's it is wonderful that we make life choices that are better, right? But we are now at a time we need to be civically in, engaged, all of us. And so 
that was as an academician. Civic engagement is more important than ever. And uh, our country is having its issues. You know, voting that occurs during a work day, it's difficult to get to. Gerrymandering, which is a, a way of saying that districts, voting districts are rearranged so that they skew results. There are many things that are happening in our democracy that are not accessible to be civically engaged as part of it. And so these are all the things that we need to be aware of and not to, if you will, um, uh, not take full advantage of that power because that's the power we have is our civic engagement. Now there's certainly differences in political structures between European and other elsewhere in countries. And uh, we're seeing the pernicious effects of that in our country where we have um, essentially a more economically conservative group that is, it, it transcends both economic from the very rich to the very poor, but economically uh, conservative, but also uh, more conservative on socioeconomic issues, as we mentioned, things such as immigration and other equity issues that are not of interest, don't want to be part of, and yet the others, our other more progressive democratic side is very diverse, unfortunately very fractured. Our Green Party that uh, has no power because we're a two-party system, unless the party gets elected, it's a two-party system. Um, and so we have fracturing that's happening because of that two-party system. Yeah. So there are challenges that we all should be aware of and know our limitations and know how much that means. We can be hopeful that change can happen, but that's not good enough. Right? Yeah. We need to stand up and to speak out and not be, if, don't, I, I think I, I am, I, I'm talking about myself, I'm not as scared of speaking out in public mm -hmm. about what I think it should. I mean, even the, the institution, um, I, I belong as a student to an institution, and sometimes in my, even my professors in the, in, in the classroom, I think uh, when I come in from a, 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 a studio, for instance, I, I need to, I need to design something, and I di completely disagree with uh, what my professor is talking about, and speak out. I started to speak out, mm -hmm. because I know I'm the oldest. I can be, <laughs> most of the time I'm the oldest in the classroom. But I think if I don't speak out, uh, most of the, my classmates are not going to speak out because they are s scared of, well, if I'm not thinking in that way, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pass my, my, my subject. Mm -hmm. So what's the point to go to the university and not to confront ideas and to debate right. ideas right. or to come out with new results, new solutions? Right, yes. So a couple of words on that as an educator, what I and how I think in terms of educating the next generation of leaders First, to make sure that students realize that they need to be engaged, they need to be knowledgeable on the issues, but also I need to provide them with skills that are relevant and, and uh, up to date in terms of data analysis, collecting data, and, and uh, if you will, processing that data. But what is most important? Critical thinking, All right? What do we mean by critical thinking? Critical thinking is asking the right question. Are we asking the right question? And, and listening. And listening. And listening. All right. Sometimes people think, as professors, they feel how well this question is not what I thought they were going to ask me, and they start being a bit nervous, <laughs> and they don't like to be criticized by the students, right. that's the problem sometimes. Right. And that's why uh, some people don't accept a critic, and uh, students um, are holding back by these uh, fears, or by yeah. these feelings. Yeah. And, and, and in that, right, in that is the challenge of being socially connected. 
socially connected with your academic leadership that is not a, willing to be receptive to your message and how you need to think about that. I'm not saying it, it's the right thing, but saying that that is part of, as an example, right? We get into situations where um, our audience that we're trying to communicate to, we need to be um, uh, very sophisticated in how we're going to influence, whether it be directly or indirectly. And that is a big part of our challenge too, is communication. And that's a big part of once we have knowledge and the things that we see and how we communicate to others that creates action is incredibly important too. And not to be oversimplified in any way, shape or form. It's an incredibly challenging part as we as humans to interconnect with each other. I think we have five, time, five minutes left for a last round of questions, if uh, there are. Yeah, one okay. over here. So I will take two or three before answering, because we, we have to go to the end. Hi, yeah, I'm a freelance photographer from London, and I'd just like to um, bring up if you've spoken to any kind of counterparts in China, because China obviously has a third of the world's population, it's got a massive industrial process happening over the last 10, 15 years. And just kind of what's basically going on there and where, whether they have something like this and whether you're in communication with people like that. Yeah. Your kind of, I don't know, academic counterparts. Yeah, yeah. So um, I will be uh, traveling to Beijing next week and I'll be visiting my counterpart in my master's in development practice uh, related to the sustainable development goals. Um, but by and large, also my uh, uh, colleague at, at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, uh, Michael McElroy, uh, works very heavily in innovation, particularly in the electricity grid. And one of the things that's happening in China is um, uh, they are the world leaders in ultra high voltage, both AC and DC grids, which is a technology that most countries are not even developing at this point. And the, one of the uh, uh, big leaps ahead in that technology is bringing renewable energy from one side of the country to the more densely populated east side of the country. So they are working very uh, uh, aggressively on renewable energy technologies uh, from a very systemic point, just as an example. But clearly, uh, the population size uh, and any, many of the inequities also that they have are, are issues. But uh, they've been the, if you will, the economic, uh, if you will, manufacturing engine, right, for the world. And now they're, they are uh, moving from uh, one that is producers to also being uh, extreme innovators at And this they've probably got the most rapid modernization that history's ever seen. Mm -hmm. So that must have a, a negative impact, surely. Right, and it's, right, it's, it's the, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, it's, you know, there's, there's even the best of the best technology, but if it's at a scale that is just at an enormous scale, well, it will have impacts nonetheless. Renewable energy has impacts too. And at its large scales, we will well, see I mean, us. they live in a kind of totalitarian right. world. How does that kind of play out? Does the government actually listen to these people? Right, and, and so to, to your point is uh, how uh, we would work with a global entity such as China in the regimes that they decide as part of their activities and then outside how do we connect and interconnect with them is incredibly important, yeah. Do we have a last question? No? Then uh, Maria Angeles Huerta, this is a professor at the university, is going to um, uh, remind the three or, or four key issues. We have a journalist here, so next time we will ask you, you to, to, do this, uh, to do this work, but uh, now she's, she's going just to, to make like a brief summary of what we have uh, uh, listening, lis listened here. Well, more than brief, I'm, I'm very ashamed because I think that here we have big professionals that could summarize a little bit better. I think we have had a great conversation. Thank you very much, Tom. And I, I wanted to just make like this trip as a summary. We started uh, talking, you started talking uh, of this as an opportunity of share things that, that we know 
and uh, also share the things that we don't know, so that is posting a lot of questions. That is, I think, what we have been doing, and how can we bring light to that? So many answers. Uh, well, I think that uh, I've learned uh, last week from your colleagues that uh, maybe the point, and I, uh, the point is not getting the answers when you are in a complex system with these big questions on the table, but uh, to making the right questions, which you always said. So the questions that arose uh, have been, how do we uh, work as civil society in a system that um, is driven by politicians and wealthy people, sorry for the very, very simplified wording, that not only deny, but avoid the rest of the people to work towards what we think it is sustainable. And that was, I think, the, one of the big, big questions. Um, many questions about energy, which is much more specific. And uh, the big question on how we do get the balance within the energy we need, which is higher and higher, and the uh, sources that we know uh, that can lead us to produce that energy. Again, a big, big question. Uh, and I would say the third, uh, last, the third last question was how do we engage people that are not only ourselves. So I think that those are like the three more precise questions that follow our dialogue. And I don't know if maybe you would, Im I invite you to, to make us a last question so you, we can engage again in a different conversation afterwards. Ah, so one, one last question, question to offer. I'll make it a challenge. Make it a challenge for you to think about what sustainability means to you and how you can act on it. How can you do something? And that could be something that we talked about as a civic, a civic action or it's a personal action. I'll just leave it as that. But you define sustainability. You've seen a lot of the pieces of it reflect on it, and then take action on it, and tell someone about it. Important task. So uh, we have to close. I remind you that we have the opportunity to have a, guide, a guided vis visit into the exhibition. I want to, to thank to uh, Matalero for uh, giving us, the university, the possibility to leave the ivory tower and to be involved with others in places like this. This is only a seed in, a, in the beginning of a process where we are convinced that we can create the spaces for connecting people, for this radical way of collaborating, for putting together ideas that's, that comes from very different experiences, and also for listening. I think it's very important to speak out, as you told, but we have to learn to listen, and to listen to those who don't, who don't uh, think like, like us. I, I, I was coming uh, uh, quickly from a, a multi-actor forum in the parliament in, in Spain, and um, what is very, very important is to realize that the elites that Francesca mentioned in the very beginning are not uh, acting, sometimes for greed, of course, but sometimes because they are not aware and are not conscious of what is happening and the consequences that uh, it may have for them and for their families. So I think we also have room for attracting those who are not involved today in this, in this game. I want to thank to designers. There are many people that are contributing to create this uh, kind of spaces. And architects, you have a responsibility. And uh, architects like Uriel, I've met him uh, in the last uh, six months. You, you are um, being a pioneer in your profession. 
um, thinking uh, uh, in design in a broader way and uh, thinking not only in the physical facilities but also in how to create the conditions for making us to think out of the box, for making uh, us to be involved in new connections. To Uriel and to Eva that was there from Matadero, the people who, who, with who we are working here in this space has been also a, a privilege for, for the university. And uh, of course, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for, for Pleasure. being here, for, for, for sharing uh, your, your knowledge with, uh, with us. And you know that here in Madrid, you have uh, uh, friends, people that are <laughs> deeply connected with, uh, with, uh, with you and um, we have a, a, a long and quick uh, way to, to walk together. I don't know, Maria Angeles, if you wanted to give some message, no? A uh, practical message or? Just another invitation. Another invitation, so. Okay, so there are a lot of things to do here at Matadero. First, of course, the visit of Mohred and uh, also, uh, there is um, this documentary filming at Cineteca, which is uh, here inside. And uh, they are showing um, a documentary that is called Habitar el Rio, so Inhabiting the River, which is the, the result of a workshop within intergenerational inter people uh, to think and to tell the river, but not from an anthrop anthropogenic, sorry, my English, an anthropogenic <laughs> point of view, but a multilateralism point of view. And that's another way to uh, get this conversation even further. So you're invited to. Thank you. Right. I have to say that Manuel, who is here, Sara, uh, uh, and others, of course, Uriel and Eva, have been uh, during months making possible to bring together scientists, artists, students, thinking uh, about how to make Matadero a much more uh, habitable space, bringing the nature again to the, to the city. And these pieces that we have here are uh, the, the, the result of a thinking process just as a starting point to open a wide conversation on how nature can be part of our daily life in, in cities. So many things are happening here. Thanks uh, uh, for, for being here. I'm very happy of uh, seeing that serendipity uh, occurs and people that are tourists in Madrid uh, uh, meet uh, here and have uh, some uh, uh, interesting thoughts to, to share with, uh, with us. And finally, a big, big, big and uh, sincere applause to uh, Tom.